Ah, the late 80s. What a time to be alive. The internet was still in its infancy. Prior to this, computer networks didn't have a standard way to communicate with each other. So until that point, humans conversed largely via the traditional way, you know, by talking to each other, sometimes in person. Radical, I know. The year on which this video is focusing, 1988, saw many weird and wonderful horror movies emerge that I had the pleasure of sneaking onto our old tube TV. Saturday nights, when our folks were out with their friends, would see my brother and I stick the likes of Return of the Living Dead Part 2, Maniac Cop, Pumpkinhead, Child's Play, and Elvira, Mistress of the Dark. You looking for me? In that temperamental old VCR. And yes, this time we made sure that every copy was rewound, you know, after we finished watching them, because we were good dudes. When you think of the slasher movies of the 80s, there is one figure who has already been mentioned a few times in our wonderful 80s horror memories series, and is such an iconic figure in horror that we could talk about his legacy for hours. Freddy Krueger is one of the most recognizable villains from the 80s, with his red and green sweater, burned to crisp good looks, razor glove, and a penchant for slaying teens in their sleep. The Nightmare on Elm Street series was a constant presence when I was growing up, and we're focusing on one of the slightly less appreciated entries in this episode. Part 4, The Dream Master. So after a classic first movie and two decent sequels, could part four continue the slash happy antics of Freddy Krueger? Or is it better left languishing in a bad dream? Want a sudden face? No. Well, let's doze off and face off against everyone's favorite melty face bad guy here on our 80s horror memories. If food don't kill you, the service will. <laughs> As I mentioned earlier, weekends in our house would involve us watching as many dubiously attained horrors on VHS as possible. But it wasn't just movies that helped shape my upbringing at the time. Rock and heavy metal were constantly on a loop on my cassette player. Metallica's And Justice For All was blasted out regularly. And after the first side had finished with one, I tried to rewind it for roughly eight minutes so that I could listen again right from the beginning. Then I'd flip it over for the delights of side two. While classic albums such as this belted out, I'd be kicking ass on Altered Beast or It Came From The Desert on the Amiga 500. I used to freak out when one of the characters in the game suddenly became an ant person. The point of this nostalgic trip back to the 80s is to highlight what exactly helped shape my love of all things horror, and the Nightmare on Elm Street series was at the forefront of my attention. Each entry had enthralled me to the point of obsession. The first movie's infamous Johnny Depp death scene with its geyser of blood in the bed, Grady's gruesome death in part two with his lifeless body hanging by the door, and the scene in part three where Freddy cuts Philip's tendons and uses them as strings to lead him to his death. All hugely iconic scenes that stayed with me for a long time afterward. I was a keen artist at school, and I'd often sketch out scenes or images from the films, much to the displeasure of my teachers. Sorry, Mrs. Woodman, but if you're going to give me a blank covered exercise book, I'm going to deface it with some horrific images. I was never the teacher's pet, but I got away with it a lot due to my infectious ability to make teachers laugh. Charm goes a long way, people. As a family, a trip to the local cinema was a regular occurrence in the 1980s, but it was normally to see age-appropriate films such as Back to the Future, Indiana Jones, and even the ever-so-risque and quite violent shark-infested Bond flick License to Kill. However, for parents who were always very liberally minded, they never took us to see a horror movie. 
Until that is, my dad couldn't wait any longer to introduce one of his favorite horror villains to me when I was definitely not an appropriate age to see it. Freddy Krueger in The Dream Master. It was the first horror film that I saw on the big screen, and probably the last that my dad took me to. I vividly remember screaming and crying when Freddy was revealed to be the nurse. So I was swept up and dragged out of there before you could say, one, two, Freddy's coming for you. The scene still makes me laugh to this day, despite those hazy memories of childhood trauma. This movie-going moment was another one of those seminal, life-affirming events that helped shape my love of movies in general, the horror genre in particular, and yes, despite my cries to the contrary, iconic movie monsters. As the years went by, and I got older and more obsessed with horror, I eventually watched all of the Elm Street films that were available at the time. What drew me into the franchise was naturally Freddy himself. I don't think there's a better or more iconic movie villain from this era. I thought that his backstory and the awesome idea that he can kill you while you slept was so intriguing. And although the character got quite a bit more cartoonish as the movies came along, I still love them regardless. Even today, watching those, they're so horrifically conceived. And, you know, England is so good in the, you know, the claws. I mean, it was, if you're going to take, you know, I don't really consider The Hitcher, for example, a franchise horror movie, uh, uh, you know, uh, but, you know, Nightmare on Elm Street really is. But it, it takes, instead of some guy running around with a machete and a ski mask, it actually comes up, it has that type of character in an absolutely, um, truly nightmarish concept beneath it that just d delves into all your deepest fears. It's ingenious. Up until the chance I got to finally see the Dream Master in its entirety, the entry that had really stuck with me, apart from the Johnny Depp slaughtering opening part, was number three, The Dream Warriors. I love that movie in all of its wonderfully demented glory. I found the cast of characters all extremely likable. Freddy began quipping some great one-liners. and it boasted some of the most inventive kills of the entire franchise. The aforementioned puppeteering of Philip via his ripped out veins was fantastic. And perhaps the most vicious example, when Freddy injects recovering addict Taryn with a lethal overdose after transforming his blades into syringes. Part four, therefore, had a lot to live up to. So could director Rennie Harlan deliver a kick-ass part four? Well, the answer to that question is more or less a big fat yes. While I didn't find it quite as engaging or as inventive as the Dream Warriors, I still massively appreciated it on its own merits. Plus, my brother and I had to wait to watch it again after our folks had gone out with the neighbors for their usual Saturday night out, whatever the hell that entailed. I can't remember exactly. They were definitely merry when they returned, however. The movie is a direct continuation of the story from The Dream Warriors. The narrative picks up with Kristen, now played by Tuesday Night in place of the departing Patricia Arquette and her fellow survivors, who are quickly dispatched to make way for new blood to be slaughtered in their slumbers. We're also introduced to Lisa Wilcox's Alice, who follows on final girl duties from Kristen and Heather Langenkamp's Nancy from Dream Warriors. Alice's transition from a meek waitress to a formidable, empowered woman by the film's end really stuck with me as a kid, just as the way that the kids from Dream Warriors fought Freddy had also done. I also dug how Freddy uses Alice to gain access to his new victims. What I remember the most about the Dream Master, when we spent that Saturday night in our living room hunkered around that shitty old tube TV, was that although I preferred part three, I loved how it took the highlights of that movie and tried to crank them up to 11. What worked so well here for me was how Freddy was still Freddy, 
he hadn't become a caricature of himself as he did in later sequels. His one-liners were awesome, especially one around the 20 minute mark when poor horny Joey meets his maker. Joey falls asleep in his room and sees a model from one of his posters swimming naked in his waterbed. Freddy pulls Joey into the waterbed, kills him, and we see the bed slowly fill with blood, along with Freddy's hilarious, How's this for a wet dream? <laughs> it's a neat throwback to Depp's bed-related death from the first film. And and although it's not quite an erupting geyser, the scene stayed with me for a long time afterward. I'll leave it up to your imagination precisely why, though. Aside from watery deaths, I also dug how the movie finds new and inventive ways to satiate fans looking for sick and twisted thrills. The Cronenberg-esque transformation into a giant cockroach was awesome. And in fact, that whole scene is great, with her arms being torn apart while working out. The practical effects looked a little rubbery, but that's the charm of the decade's approach to VFX. I prefer old school aesthetics to some of the ropey looking CGI in modern horror films. What I ultimately loved about the Elm Street franchise wasn't the inventive kills and Freddy's one-liners, which I suppose became a touch too cartoonish as the series progressed. It was some of the more niche and fun elements. Just take the Dream Master for example, and there are several scenes that have become synonymous with the franchise. Rick's karate practice and the moment where he's teaching his sister some moves, resulting in one of her sneakers flying into the fish tank, had me creased up. Also, you can't have a good horror movie with some action elements without a campy but cool gearing up to kick the bad guy's ass montage. Again, I totally dug this moment when Alice goes full John Matrix and tools up, ready to fight Freddy. Ultimately, A Nightmare on Elm Street 4 The Dream Master remains one of my all-time favorite entries in the series. It may not be up there with the original or even the Dream Warriors, but its cool set pieces and inventive kills are an absolute delight. You flunk. Even if I was freaked out when my dad took me to see it at 5 years old. Thanks dad, you rock. As always though, your opinion means the most to us here at Joe Blow. So let us know your thoughts on the Dream Master in the comments. Bring me more. On the next episode, if you're in a shop for birthday presents in a dark alley, make sure you double check to see if batteries are included with Child's Play. Until next time, Gore Hounds. Ugly doll. Fuck you. Hi friends, your humble narrator Tyler Nichols here, and I hope that you enjoyed that episode of 80s Horror Memories. If you missed our previous episode, click over here. If you want to see more from our series, click up here. And if you're not subscribed yet, what are you doing? Subscribe right here. And most importantly, stay spooky, folks.